And we pray that your word would have its full effect in our hearts and lives this morning. Lord, we surrender ourselves to the authority of your word. And we pray, Lord, that your will would be done in us and through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. That sounds okay? For the past six weeks, we've been looking at uh, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus and how encountering the risen Lord changed and transformed his disciples. This morning, I want to look at the disciples' last encounter with Jesus, the only one recorded in Matthew's gospel after Easter morning, and how that encounter forever changed the direction and purpose of their lives. Now, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, has anyone read The Purpose Driven Life? It came out many years ago. Uh, But in The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren writes, it's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. Now, I love that first part. It's not about you. Uh, This can be hard for us to take, can it? Uh, But that doesn't make it any less true. In order for us to figure out our purpose, no matter how young we are, no matter how old we are, no matter what season of life we might find ourselves in, we need to start not with ourselves. We need to start with God. As Warren says, we were born by God's purpose and for God's purpose. And we need to trust that God has a plan for our lives. Now, Scripture tells us over and over again in the Old Testament and in the the New that we were not put on this earth by accident. God made us and God formed us. God created us and designed us and has called us for a, pur- for a purpose. And in fact, I would argue that calling and purpose go together. In calling the prophet Jeremiah, God said, Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. And before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. Scripture is full of stories like this. Stories of God calling people and how they answered and what God's purpose was for their lives. And and God continues to call people today. Just like Jeremiah, God has set us apart for a special work. And this special work is, is not only our purpose, but it is our mission. It is our mission. Now, the word mission comes from the Latin word missio, which means sending. Sending. And the dictionary defines mission as a continuing task or responsibility that one is destined or fitted to do or specially called upon to undertake. A continuing task or responsibility that one is destined or fitted to do or specially called upon to undertake. Three words stand out in this definition. Destined, fitted, and specifically. Right? All three point to the uniqueness of mission. In other words, if we fail to do the special work that God created us to do, it won't get done. Because we were uniquely made to do it. Now, in addition to the unique purpose that God has for each of us as Christians, we're called to work together in a shared mission. And this shared mission is to bring Christ to the world. Uh, Anglican priest and theologian J.I. Packer, he writes in his book, A Concise Theology, he writes this about mission. He says, this appointed task is twofold. First, and fundamentally, It is the work of worldwide witness, disciple-making, and church planting. 
Jesus Christ is to be proclaimed everywhere as God incarnate, Lord and Savior. And God's invitation to find life through turning to Christ in repentance and faith. Second, all Christians and therefore every congregation are called to practice deeds of mercy and compassion. A thoroughgoing neighbor love that responds to all forms of human need as they present themselves. Compassion was the inward action, aspect of the neighbor love that led Jesus to heal the sick and feed the hungry. And those who are new creatures in Christ must be similarly compassionate. So this shared mission that Packer writes about, it has its root in our reading this morning from the end of Matthew's gospel. That was just uh, read for us by Gail. I think it's safe to say, I don't think anyone here would disagree, the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. It changed everything. And Jesus' final words in the Gospel of Matthew show us the implications of this change for our everyday lives. Mission is the last thought that Matthew leaves with his readers. It's the last thought that Matthew leaves with his readers because his aim in writing his gospel wasn't simply to chronicle the life of Jesus. His aim was to show people that Jesus really was the Messiah, whose mission was to bring the kingdom of God to the world. Matthew's gospel, therefore, ends with a very clear sense that there's something more to do. Another chapter that needs to be written. Right? Matthew's gospel ends with a charge. It ends with a command, a mission, a great commission, as it's commonly called. That the risen Jesus gives to his followers to make disciples of all nations. Think about it this way. Jesus' mission on earth. Everything that he came to do had been accomplished. But the disciples' mission was just beginning. And so I would argue that as believers in Christ, it is vital for us to understand this mission. Because if we don't, if we don't know what we're supposed to do, we will most likely not end up doing it. And I would argue there are countless Christian communities in this world who are not doing the Great Commission. Now what I find interesting about this Great Commission is the strong presence of four alls. Four alls in just three verses. All authority, all nations, all that I have commanded, and I am with you always. And so this morning, I want to look at this last encounter with the risen Jesus. I want to look at the meaning of these four alls so that we can hopefully better live the Great Commission out in our lives and through this fellowship and this congregation. So number one is all authority. All authority. This is universal lordship. All authority and universal lordship. Verses 16 to 18 reads, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So let's look at this little bit first. I think it is important to note that this appearance occurs on a mountain. Right? In both the Old and New Testaments, important and authoritative events often took place on mountains. Right, think about it. The Ten Commandments. Elijah's defeat of the prophets of Baal. The Sermon on the Mount. The feeding of the 5,000. The Transfiguration. The Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Even the Gethsemane Prayer. They all took place on a mountain. And so a mountain then is a fitting setting for the significance of this event. And this moment. In the life of the disciples. Matthew tells us that upon seeing Jesus, the disciples worshipped him. Now, the Greek word here for worship, proskuneo, means to fall down, revere, kneel, pay homage, and make supplication. 
to fall down, revere, kneel, pay homage, make supplication. This is the first time the disciples responded like this. However, I think it's very easy for us to miss the significance, probably because we worship Jesus whenever we come into his presence. But we need to remember that these, Jew, that these Jewish men, for whom the first and second commandment forbid giving worship to anyone but the one true God of Israel, fell down and worshiped Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Worship was reserved for God and God alone. And so in falling down before Jesus, the disciples were acknowledging who he truly was. And more importantly, they were acknowledging who they believed he truly was. Now this action, I think, also shows us that mission always starts and ends with adoration. Right? Mission always starts and ends with worship. In his book, The Supremacy of God in Missions, John Piper writes, Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship does not. Worship is the ultimate, not missions. Because God is the ultimate, not man. When this age is over, and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their face before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and the goal of missions. It is the goal of missions because in missions, we simply aim to bring the nations into the enjoyment of God's presence and God's glory. It's a very interesting perspective, isn't it, on the role of worship and mission. Now, although a number of the disciples prostrated themselves before the Lord, Matthew also tells us, though, that some doubted. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of take comfort in that, really. And that simple phrase, but some doubted, tells us four things. First of all, we will continually have to deal with our own doubts. They were standing in front of the risen Jesus, and they still doubted. We will continually have to deal with our doubts. It also tells us that doubts don't qualify us for mission. It tells us that within every group, there are some who worship and some who waffle. And it tells us that the mission of the church is sometimes advanced in the midst of our doubt. Now, Jesus makes a very important statement in verse 18. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I would argue that everything that follows that verse, everything that follows in verses 19 and 20 are based on that one claim. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What is Jesus saying here? Well, the Greek word for authority is exousia. Or exousia. It carries a wide range, a range of meanings, which includes power of choice, freedom, right, jurisdiction, strength, and ability. So power of choice, freedom, right, jurisdiction, strength, ability. In the context of this verse, though, I think it's best thought of as to rule. But the usage is more focused on the scope of the authority and not the amount. And so what I mean by that is Jesus doesn't have more power in this moment than before he was crucified. Right? He was and is the Son of God. What is different here is the declaration of his victory on earth and in heaven. That's what's different. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, that the Father has given Jesus this, this authority through the conquering of death. And now Jesus becomes the one through whom all God's authority is mediated. Paul puts it this way later on in, Roman, in, sorry, in Philippians 2, verses 9 and 11. He says, Therefore, 
God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Right? You, you can't put it any clearer than that. I am not Lord. You are not Lord. Bishop Charlie is not Lord. The Pope is not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the prophet who declares the word of God. He is the priest who makes sacrifice for sins. And he is the king who mediates God's rule. Right? He is all in all. As we just sang, he is all to us. This is what led the 19th century theologian Abraham Kuyper to say, in the total expanse of human life, right, think about that, that's everything. In the total expanse of human life, there is not a single inch of which Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare, that is mine. I love that. In the total expanse of human life, there is not a single square inch of which Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare, that is mine. Everything falls under the banner of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And understanding, loving, and believing, this serves, I think, as a great motivator for what comes next. The next part of this great commission is all nations. All nations, which is a universal mission. A universal mission. In verses 19 to 20, Jesus says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Now, I don't think it is a coincidence that Matthew starts his gospel with a reference to to the two most promise-loaded names in the Bible, right? The, the Gospel of Matthew begins with these words, an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. An eternal king was promised through David, and from Abraham was promised an heir who would be a blessing to all nations. And so as such, the disciples are given here a message that is to be universal in who it reaches. It's to be ongoing everywhere and anywhere that there are people. And there are four important points here. Point number one is therefore. We're going to look at each one of these words. Therefore, this is a linking word, right? It connects what comes next with what followed or what came before. Everything that Jesus says, all that we have been given to do is based on his universal and unquestioned lordship. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? We are sent out as ambassadors of the authoritative one. And we are sent out with Jesus' authority, not our own. In fact, I would argue we have no authority to preach God's word or to do God's work unless we abide under the lordship of his son. We have no authority when we step outside of the lordship of Jesus. The next point, number two, is go. He says, therefore, go. Now, this suggests that we're not to sit around in church and wait for people to come to us. We are to go to them. Right? We are people who are sent out. And Jesus would have us on the offensive, so to speak. Not the defensive. Poreo, the Greek word for go, literally means in your going or as you go. Right? In your going or as you go. In other words, we are to make disciples in the natural course of our lives. We are to make disciples as we live out our everyday lives from one day to the next, wherever we go. And so in this sense, the word go is not really a command, but a given. Right? As we go, as we live, this is what we should do. 
Number three, the next point, or the third point, make disciples. So, therefore, go make disciples. This mission involves multiple elements, but I would argue one main thrust. The main thrust, in my opinion, of the Great Commission is to make disciples, which is the only command in the passage, and it lies at the center of the commission. The other words, go, baptizing, teaching, they're also important, but I believe they serve the primary command to make disciples. Now, the word disciple comes from the Greek mathetes, and the Latin disciples. It means learner, student, or apprentice. It's that simple. Learner, student, apprentice. Disciple is used in three ways, basically, in the Bible. A disciple refers to anybody who is being trained or mentored by someone else. So Moses' disciple was Joshua. Elijah's disciple was Elisha. Paul's disciple was Timothy. It's also used to refer specifically to Jesus' 12 selected followers, right? Peter, James, John, Matthew, you know them all. And in the book of Acts, once the faith spread from Israel into Antioch, disciple became synonymous with the new term Christian. In other words, anyone who follows Jesus is a Christian and is a disciple. In this command to make disciples, Jesus has charged his followers with the task of replicating themselves. In other words, this mission isn't just a teaching mission. It's not just a conversion mission. It is a mission where teaching and truth produce changed people. It's a calling to be in the process of producing people who are followers of the Lord. Right? To be a disciple isn't a higher level of spiritual maturity or growth, right? Reserved for an elite group of believers. To be a disciple is the starting point and the end point for every believer because discipleship is a lifelong process. We are never not a disciple. We are never not learning and being mentored by the Holy Spirit. And finally, point number four of all nations. Of all nations. Now, as I've already said, the target audience that Jesus is sending his disciples to isn't confined to a small group of people or to a geographical area. It's not just to the Jews that Jesus is sending his disciples, but to all nations, to the whole world. Ethnos, the Greek word here for nations, is where we get the word ethnic. It means tribe, nation, people group, multitude. Tribe, nation, people group, multitude. Elsewhere in the New Testament, this same word ethnos is used by the Apostle Paul to refer to Gentiles, heathens, foreigners, and non-Jewish believers. In other words, their disciple-making efforts shouldn't be homegrown, internally or nationally limited, but extend to the ends of the earth and to include all people. So that is all nations. Thirdly is all that I have commanded, all that I have commanded. This is a universal message, a universal message. Verse 20 reads, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So what's happening here in verse 20 is Jesus is fleshing out, if I can use that term, He's fleshing out what this process of discipleship is to look like. And he's fleshing this out. He's doing this by identifying two important elements of the making disciples process. The first element is baptism. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Greek word here, baptizo, literally means to immerse, submerge, 
Cleanse, wash, make clean. Immerse, submerge, cleanse, wash, make clean. Now, without getting into a huge theological discussion or perhaps even a debate, I'm going to speak very generally here. Baptism is a ritual of initiation into the life of Christian discipleship. In fact, I would argue that discipleship and baptism are so closely linked that you really can't, nor should you, have one without the other. Baptism represents a cleansing and a purification from sin and sin's power. In other words, the going down into the water and the coming up again is a powerful symbol of what happens when a person invites Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior. Right? When a person accepts Jesus' finished work on the cross. Right? It is a dying to the old self. It is a dying to our flesh-dominated appetites and a rising to the new spirit-controlled life in Christ. And so because of that, I would argue that baptism is a sign of separation from the world and identification with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism, if you will, uh, liturgically, is an outward expression of an inner confession. Baptism, first and foremost, is a public profession of faith. It is a public profession of faith, of loyalty, of allegiance, of devotion, and commitment to the Lordship of Christ. That's the first element of this command. The second is, number, is teaching. Teaching. Now, the Greek word here, didasko, means to teach, hold discourse, impart instruction, instill doctrine, explain or expound. Did you get all that? Teach, hold discourse, impart instruction, instill doctrine, explain or expound. So, this is what goes on in classrooms, in colleges, in universities, in homes, in many places all over the world every day. Teaching. But the connotation here, I think, is about so much more than just the dissemination of content. And learning alone is not the goal. Jesus says here, teaching to observe all that I have commanded. So he qualifies the teaching. Right? They're not just to go out and teach. They're to go out and teach to observe, or some translations say obey, all that I have commanded you. The word observe comes from the Greek terero. It means keep, reserve, guard, persevere, attend to, hold fast, or obey. So keep, reserve, guard, persevere, attend to, hold fast, and obey. In other words, true discipleship isn't just about head knowledge. It's teaching people how to obey. It's teaching people how to live that head knowledge out in their everyday lives. It's teaching people how to allow that head knowledge to have its full effect in and through them. Right? It's not enough for us to know the truth. The truth has to have an impact on our life. And why is that? Because, as I have said in this series, the goal of the Christian life is transformation. The Word of God needs to change us, not just rattle around in our brains. Discipleship is the mission of the church because it is the definition of what it means to be a Christian. And finally, number four, and you're going to have to jig your hand out a little bit because it's not going to fit properly there, but uh, the last all is, I am with you always. I am with you always, or a universal help. A universal help. While Jesus gives what seems like an impossible task, 
He does so not only with his authority, but also his promise. He says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, if we really understand the fullness of the gospel, if we really understand the mission of the church, And if we really understand the true nature of the world we live in, then we know why we need this promise. We can't do this on our own. Instead of the word behold, some translations use the word amen, I am with you always, or lo, I am with you always. The Greek word iduo literally means see, behold, remember. See, behold, remember. Jesus knew that the mission he was giving the disciples wouldn't be easy. He knew that they would struggle in carrying it out. He knew that they were human, that they were weak and prone to fear. So that's why he gives them this promise. No matter how challenging and difficult the task may seem, No matter how challenging or difficult the Great Commission is, we need to remember two things. We need to remember, number one, Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. Hebrews 13.5 puts it this way, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We are not alone because Jesus is with us continuously without break. And the implication of this isn't just some future hope. It's a present reality. Every step of the way, every risky step, every moment when we feel uncomfortable, every situation where we feel stretched out of our depth or over our head, in living out this great commission, Jesus promises to be with us. And the second thing we need to remember is Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our strength. In Matthew 16, 18, so earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, this is after Peter makes that great declaration, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail it. Will not prevail against it. Now notice Jesus says here, I will build my church. Yes, the Great Commission is ours. And we definitely have a role to play, but Jesus is the one who's going to accomplish it. Jesus is the one who builds his church. And try as he may, the enemy will not prevail because Jesus is the victorious one. Jesus, by means of his Holy Spirit, promises to always be with those who are fulfilling the Great Commission. And notice he says here, always. I am with you always. Not sometimes or not when we get it right, but all our days. Days of strength and days of weakness. Days of success and days of failure. Days of joy and days of sorrow. Days of health And days of sickness, days of liberty and days of temptation, days of wealth and days of poverty. He's with us. His promise here is similar to his promise in John 14, 8. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And we see the fulfillment of both promises, or we'll celebrate the fulfillment of both promises next Sunday when we celebrate Pentecost. And the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is present with us always through his Holy Spirit who is with us. Who is in us and through us. And so this promise to be with us always. Jesus' empowering presence can not only bring us comfort and hope. But can also overcome our weaknesses and our fears. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The disciples' last encounter with the risen Jesus on the mountain that day changed their lives forever. I mean, no longer were they to be fishermen. 
They were given a new purpose, a mission to fish for people. And as his followers, 2,000 years later, we have been given the same mission, right? Like those first disciples, we too have been sent out to make disciples. And the word go isn't just an action or an activity, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. It means that we never treat the gospel as if it were meant just for us. Right? To make us happy and to make us whole and to make us complete. I mean, yes, the gospel does that. But it was meant to be spread. Right? It was meant to be given away. Every follower of Jesus, that means every single one of you and me, has a disciple-making, gospel-spreading duty. Right? We have a disciple-making, gospel-spreading calling on our lives. So this means that our orientation in life has to be different, especially for life in North America. Right? We need to remember that our mission from Jesus isn't to assimilate into the culture. Right? Our mission is not to blend in, to act like, be like, spend like, look like everyone else. Our mission isn't to align the values and teachings of the church with the values and teachings of the world. That's not our mission. Our mission is to go anywhere the good news is not. And especially to those places where it has not been heard or where it is neglected. And I believe this is something that we have to continually work on and seek God's help as individuals and as a church. We need to continually seek to have a spread the gospel, give it away, reach the unreached mindset in the midst of a culture that often pulls us in the exact opposite direction. This great commission motivated, externally focused mindset is risky and it's difficult. It means that we are called to make sacrifices. It means that we are called to stand for what we believe, often in the midst of hostility. This means that we are called to swim against the stream and not with it, to stand out, to look different. It means we live on less so that we can give more. It means we associate with people who are different than us. It means we serve in areas of the city that aren't familiar. That we go to places where we don't want to go. And sometimes do things we don't want to do. But we do so remembering that we're not alone. That Jesus is with us and ultimately he will build his church. Matthew ends his gospel with a very clear statement that the victorious Christ calls his disciples to a global mission, promising his continued presence. He wants them and he wants us to see that the universal lordship of Christ creates a universal mission with a universal message and a universal help. In other words, friends, King Jesus has won. Go and spread his kingdom. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have elevated your son to a place in heaven beside you. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus is Lord over all. And so, Father, we submit ourselves to you. We lay down our lives, all that we are, and all that we have, under the Lordship of Jesus, to be used by him, to be used by your Spirit, to spread the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would give each one of us a renewed passion to make disciples. That we wouldn't hoard the grace 
that you have given us, the gospel that you have entrusted to us. We wouldn't hoard it for ourselves, but would have a burning desire to share it with those people whom we encounter every day. Father, help us to receive once again this morning this mission. And help us to live the purpose that you have called us to. And in doing so, Lord, may you get all the honor and all the glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. Amen.